Thank you very much. I want to dedicate this talk tonight to the caretakers of those with Alzheimer's disease. It's a tough job physically, and it's a heartbreaking job to see people fade away that you love and know. But there is some hope. While the currently used drugs don't offer a lot of hope, there are techniques that we can use to really improve the situation. For instance, in the trial that Stephen Shore just mentioned, you can see the graph. People started in the beginning stages of dementia. And by the time, actually only three months went by, they were already testing in the normal range. And at the end of nine months, they were, well, 29 out of 30 on the test for memory and cognition. This is the team that we had to help us run the trial, the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial. It's a big undertaking to do a randomized clinical trial, and it took a lot of people. Every one of us worked without pay to do this trial because there was no vitamin manufacturer to write checks. And we did it gladly because we were able to actually make a difference. I designed the trial and I ran the trial with a lot of help, and I'm also the lead author of the paper, which you can see on the screen, which is in the Journal of Brain Sciences and was published just exactly one year ago. I'd like to just briefly familiarize you with some of my other work that also bears on this work. My latest book is Diabetes Breakthrough, and this is also valuable information for the brain, which burns a lot of the energy in our body. I have written a book, Arthritis Relief, and this also bears on the brain because inflammation can increase pain in the joints, but inflammation can also increase the damage and destruction of our brain cells. The Diet Doctor software is one of my favorites, and I use it all the time to analyze diets. Has anyone here ever analyzed your diet to see what's in it? Nutrients are largely invisible. So how do you know if you get enough calcium or too much saturated fat? Well, for me, I checked the diet and I found out exactly how much people are getting, or myself, and then the diet can be adjusted so that we get the optimum range of nutrition. I won't go over all my books right now, and this is just a sampling, but The Fats and Oil Demystified is a textbook that helps people to understand this very much misunderstood subject of fats and oils. Some people actually think that saturated fats are essential for health. They're not. But it's a good idea to learn the basics about fats and oils, which ones are essential, which ones are not so good to get too much of. Um, on the bottom left, you can see a book, Nutrients for Memory, and that summarizes the talk that I'll give you tonight, but with much more information on what we did. And my goal here today is to tell you what we did in the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, the great results we got, and the fact is you can do it yourself. None of this is prescription medication. And something else about my work is that I will only use approaches that are safe. I never use approaches that are dangerous in any way. Another thing is that I base all of my evidence on peer-reviewed medical studies, which I read <laughs> a lot. So does diet have any power over dementia? Well, here's a study. Uh, this was done at the, um, actually they used a MIND diet, which MIND diet is a combination of the Mediterranean diet and an antihypertensive diet designed to lower blood pressure. They were able to lower the age of people so that they delayed dementia for seven and a half years. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, let's keep our minds young as long as possible. What did they do? In this trial, basically, it was a lot of berries, green vegetables, and less animal fat. We can do that, right? This trial, the Rush Memory and Aging Project, uh, lead author is uh, Martha Claire Morris, and she did an excellent job, reported in 2018 in the most prestigious journal, Neurology, the equivalent of 11 years younger on people who ate one to two servings of green vegetables a day compared with people who didn't eat much green vegetables at all. Wow. 
our chief neuropsychologist has stated that if we could delay dementia for 10 years, that would be the end of the epidemic. Why? Because it often strikes in the 80s, and if you're dead when it happens, it doesn't bother you, right? <laughs> so let's delay it as much as possible. Unfortunately, the drugs that are used, there's two basic drugs that are used by neurologists to combat Alzheimer's disease. Donepezel, brand named Aricept, is the most common one that is dispensed very freely to those with memory problems. It's FDA approved for mild, well, for moderate and severe Alzheimer's disease, but it's also used for mild Alzheimer's disease and also mild cognitive impairment, kind of the precursor to dementia. Uh, unfortunately, according to this recent study in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, there has minimal effects on cognition, but 76% more vomiting and 62% more diarrhea. That doesn't sound very good, does it? We have some solutions here tonight that do not involve those unpleasant situations, but that work as well or better than donepezil. The other drug that's used is memantine, and memantine is not very effective, and it has some adverse side effects. Blood clots, psychosis, and heart failure are some of the side effects. So it's a good idea to look at safer approaches, don't you think? What about supplements? Can they have any effect on dementia? Well, this study, elders were supplemented with a small amount of synthetic vitamin E, not a good idea, a small amount of vitamin C and some beta carotene for four months. But even this supplementation, which isn't perfect by any means, managed to improve their memory about 15% compared to control group where they did not improve their memory, they stayed about the same. So it may be possible, and in the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, I used both dietary changes and also supplements. I want to tell you a little bit about dementia. The term is often misused. In this pie chart, only the two gray pie wedges are not involved with either vascular dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the biggest part of dementia in America, but I would say that it is almost always accompanied by vascular dementia and clogging of the arteries that supply the brain. Good blood perfusion to the brain is essential for us to think. It's one of the reasons why exercise, physical exercise, is really helpful. The incidence of Alzheimer's disease is risen alarmingly and is forecast to continue rising alarmingly. If you take a good look at the American diet and the, how can I say gently, the junk food diets around the world, things are only going to get worse unless people eat better. And also, there are other ways, too, besides nutrition. This is kind of a sad picture because it shows the before and after of Alzheimer's disease. On the left, we have a normal brain on the top. And on the right, you see a brain shrunken to about half its size. What has happened is that the brain cells, the neurons themselves, have died, half of them. This is called neurodegeneration, and neither drug used for Alzheimer's disease slows or stops or reverses this neurodegeneration. But we do have tools that can help with that. What we'd like to do is protect the cells in the brain so that they don't die off. And when do you start this process? Prenatal would be a good time. <laughs> through pregnancy, through childhood, through early life, midlife, and late life. So wherever you are, you can benefit from protecting your brain cells. We'd like to have as many left as we possibly can. Now the bottom shows, it's a PET scan, and it shows glucose activity. Glucose activity is more where you see the yellow and the red. Where there's yellow and red, there's more glucose activity, but sadly, look at the Alzheimer's brain on the right, and you see that there's very little activity. And this is reflected in the eyes of those with Alzheimer's disease, with advanced Alzheimer's disease like this. One of the reasons why there's no glucose activity there is, of, 
of course, because of tau tangles and Alzheimer's plaques that I'll mention more about, but also lack of circulation to the brain. And we can greatly aid this circulation to the brain. Vascular dementia is a big contributor. I'll describe that more. And we can reverse vascular dementia, or rather, you can. <laughs> Plant diets. This is an assembly, a conference about plant diets. So I found a 2019 study here, uh, among many others, that talk about the parts of a plant diet that can be beneficial. Polyphenols are a large class of plant chemicals, including flavonoids, flavones, uh, the still beans such as resveratrol. It's a huge class of anti-inflammatory and antioxidant chemicals in plants. Now, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory mean less brain cell death. So that's one of the ways that these plant diets help. Also, antioxidants fight the free radical damage that destroys the brain cells. So why not have some vitamin C and vitamin E available to the brain? Vitamin E cannot work but once without vitamin C to come and recharge it. Then it can work again. Then you need vitamin C again to recharge it. So the two work together. Carotenoids are the colorful pigments that you see in fruits and vegetables and even yams. These carotenoids are tremendously effective in protecting the brain. They are fat-soluble antioxidants. That means they're very effective in the cell membrane that covers each cell in the brain. And those membranes are often attacked by free radicals, and when they're damaged, or the mitochondrial membranes inside them, then the brain cells can die. Carotenoids are very protective. And where are they found? Fruits, vegetables, and some roots. When they did post-mortem studies on Alzheimer's brains, they found that the Alzheimer's brains had lower levels of beta carotene and lutein and other carotenoids. Did you know that lutein is a carotenoid most accumulated in the brain, also in the retina of the eye, and it's an antiomer, zeaxanthin, is also found in the brain and the eye, very protective. And our brains would love to accumulate these carotenoids so that we can protect ourselves from free radical damage. Those fuzz balls in the picture are called amyloid plaque or senile plaque. And they're produced over a long period of time, many decades. Another reason why I'd like people to start early in their defense of their brain. They're involved in about 80% of dementia cases. Do they cause dementia? It's an interesting question. We're not sure. But they certainly are existent more in Alzheimer's brains than not. But there are some very normal old brains with Alzheimer's plaques where there is no memory or cognition problems at all. These are clumps of protein that occur between the nerve cells. They interfere with nerve transmission and they're very toxic to the brain, killing brain cells. Now, tau tangles occur inside the brain cells and they are also very toxic. Hyperphosphorylated tau proteins is the big name. We just call them tau tangles usually. The two pictures on the right and the left are pictures of the same thing. You see what I mean? On the left, we have lots of foods, heavy and saturated fat and animal fat. And on the right, we have the result of those foods, clogged arteries. When you eat a diet high in saturated fat, and many American diets are very high in saturated fat, you get an increase of cholesterol in the bloodstream and you get increased production of amyloid plaques in the brain. The higher the cholesterol, and it gets kind of technical as the cholesterol contributes to the lipid rafts on the membranes of the brain where the transmembrane proteins go through, like the amyloid precursor protein, and it creates more amyloid plaque. Good idea to keep your cholesterol lower anyway for heart disease and stroke risk. Arterial blockage is very common. You've probably heard of some people who have carotid artery blockage in their carotid arteries. Sometimes 70 or 80% occluded. This means that very little blood can get up to the brain. If you eat a diet lower in saturated fat, you actually can 
start reducing the blockage in your arteries. And later in the conference, uh, Dr. Esselstyn will come and tell you about how to reverse this clogging in the arteries, and I'll tell you about it here too. Vascular dementia, which I've mentioned, is really the accumulation of tiny strokes. So first, you eat a lot of saturated fat, and then you get a lot of plaque built up on your arteries, and then a little bit of the plaque breaks away and plugs a tiny arteriole or a capillary, and the branch of brain cells that that feeds dies off, and then it happens again and again and again. Tiny little strokes happening all over the brain, eating up your memories, eating up who you are. This is not necessary, and this is reversible. So to keep blood cholesterols low, reduce the saturated fat in the diet, which is usually animal fat. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what happens as you age. Some people think that everyone gets dementia as they get old. Not true at all. There's some very sharp 80 and 90 year old people. It's not inevitable. With normal aging, you may forget part of an experience, but you eventually remember it. But with dementia, you might forget the entire experience and never remember it. Instructions and notes to yourself are helpful in normal aging. I know I use them. But with dementia, the notes aren't very helpful. People with dementia will take a shopping list and they'll forget to look at the shopping list. But the bottom line with dementia is, can you take care of yourself? And the, when the activities of daily living are no longer possible, then that's true dementia. And then you require those caretaker to help you. And whether it's a relative, a friend, a neighbor, or a professional, it's gonna be a lot of work to take care of someone with dementia. And it's also a huge economic burden a lot of, for a lot of families. This is a little bit technical, but it's good to have a little bit of science in the crowd. The first graph on the left, it's kind of orange, shows you the buildup of amyloid plaque and note that it happens decades before dementia actually occurs. You can see on the bottom where it says dementia over there. Um, so this line comes up here. Long before dementia occurs, the amyloid plaque is built up almost to its maximum level. That's why we're not so sure how much it's involved, but I'll tell you more about that. Now, the tau tangles are a better indicator. That's this green line here. Tau tangles parallel the brain cell death, and those two go together. But we can help with brain cell death. We can load our brains up with antioxidants, and we can quit eating the foods that are damaging and destroying our brain cells. So we have some control over that. Cognition, which is the purple line here, this starts to be problematic at the beginning of mild cognitive impairment. And then at the end of mild cognitive impairment, it's really getting to be a problem. Now, mild cognitive impairment is kind of in between normal aging and dementia. And it's really a broad pattern because when you first enter mild cognitive impairment, well, you're nearly normal for your age but when you exit mild cognitive impairment, you're actually in dementia. So the brain has already shrunk by about 10%. We don't want it to shrink to 50%, so that's why I'm here tonight. Tau tangles already in the brain and the amyloid plaques are in the brain. Memory and thinking is becoming difficult, but in mild cognitive impairment or MCI, it's still easy enough to take care of yourself and you don't need help. Mild cognitive impairment tends to lead to dementia. It can be seen as the precursor to dementia. So as you see the graph on the left over here, little by little, people graduate to dementia from mild cognitive impairment, perhaps 10% a year. Estimates vary, different populations vary. But if people continue to do what they're doing when they got mild cognitive impairment, then it's more or less inevitable that they will sooner or later progress to dementia but we can change our habits. And that's why I'm here today, is to help you change our habits. People in our trial change their habits, and instead of being just below de dementia, they became quite normal. This is a scale of the mini mental status exam. 20 is kind of the cutoff point for dementia. 25 
is the cutoff point for mild cognitive impairment, and this area between 25 and 30 is the normal area. And missing one of the 30 questions is not abnormal at all. That happens, it can happen to anyone. Uh, so how did we do it? What did we do to make this happen? Well, first you get a pretty picture to rest your brains and eyes. Here are the 16 interventions. Now, when I proposed this trial, the scientists I work with, our statistician said, no, you're supposed to test one chemical, not 16 diverse things. But my goal was to say, can we reverse dementia? So I wanted to put in all the 16 best things that I had seen evidence for in clinical trials. Randomized, controlled clinical trials from all over the world have shown me that each of these different changes are very helpful. So among the dietary changes, one cup of berries daily. Is there anyone here who already eats one cup of berries daily? Great. Anyone here is willing to start eating one cup of berries daily? I'll show you a study later. Great, fantastic. That shows that an average of two years delayed dementia just with one cup of berries a day and no other interventions. So we specified for our people blueberries, strawberries, or red grapes. Now blueberries and strawberries are very low in glycemic load, so even people with diabetes seem to be okay with that. It does not increase blood sugar a lot. But they're loaded with enormously helpful antioxidants, anthocyanins, and so on. Walnuts and sunflower seeds were chosen because walnuts are loaded with a gamma tocopherol form of vitamin E. And sunflower seeds are just loaded with the alpha tocopherol form of vitamin E. So by combining the two, we're really covering the bases on that essential element, vitamin E. Now because the study was done with people 65 years or better, as I like to say, uh, some of these people had diverticuli, bowel pockets, and their doctors forbid them to eat any nuts or seeds. So we had people simply put the nuts in, into a coffee grinder, buzz them up into powder, and then eat them that way without heating. So that meant that everyone could take them. Also, you get a much better digestion of the nutrients inside the nuts and seeds if you grind them up, because your digestive activity can hit all parts of, of it instead of there being little microscopic mountains that aren't chewed up inside there. We changed cooking methods, and this was to prevent the formation of advanced glycation end products, which I'll tell you about. We also lowered the saturated fat in the diet, and that was the toughest thing that we did. Uh, there was a lot of noncompliance on lowering saturated fat in diet because that means eating less animal fat, and animal fat's a real favorite of people in Hawaii, and I imagine it is here in New York, too. Okay, we used uh, quite a few supplements. There's four antioxidant minerals that I'll explain. We used a mixed form of vitamin E to supplement the nuts and seeds. We used vitamin C to boost the antioxidant power in the body. We also used coenzyme Q10, which has two effects. One is it's necessary for production of aerobic energy in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. It's essential. And it's also known as ubiquinone. It's ubiquitous everywhere in the body. But as we age, we tend to produce a little less of this coenzyme Q10. So it's very safe, natural in the body, and so we did supplement with that. We also used the folate, uh, the real form of folate, not folic acid, the synthetic form. Folate is safe. The folic acid form has some potential for raising cancer risk if over 1,000 micrograms a day. We used vitamin C and um, Vitamin B12, now folate and vitamin B12 work together, and I'll show you how that works as we go along. We use SAMe. Does anyone know about s methionine? Yeah, this is naturally made in our bodies if we have enough folate and vitamin B12, but just like the vitamin E, we wanted to do it two different ways because it's so important. Guess what this stuff does? Those genes that everyone's talking about, creating Alzheimer's plaques, and some people have more of those genes, this quenches them. It quiets them. It puts them to sleep. So they no longer make the enzymes that make Alzheimer's plaque. Very important if you don't want any progression. And that's one of my goals, is that when people are 
getting problems with their memory, whatever stage people are in, I ask them, what if you didn't get any worse? What if you could say, as you are today, without this horror of losing your mind completely, uniformly everyone said, yes, I would take that. So we want to do that, definitely. We use two medical plants. I chose these two because the research on them is just excellent. Medical plants aren't used by American medical doctors or neurologists. Uh, they are used, however, all over the world. These two plants have tons of research, and they're completely safe. There's one possible drug interaction with ginkgo biloba, and I'll mention that as we go through the talk. My website is drsteveblake.com. Please visit if you'd like more information. People talk a lot about antioxidants. Well, antioxidants are needed to protect the brain. They're also needed to protect every other part of our body. It's been estimated that every cell in our body experiences 10,000 to 100,000 free radical attacks every day. Okay, do the math. <laughs> That's a lot of free radical attacks, and we need these antioxidants. Now, some antioxidants come from food or supplements, and other antioxidants are made inside our bodies. The ones from food, the carotenoids, wonderful antioxidants from colorful fruits and vegetables. Vitamin C, found in fruits and vegetables, but not other places, except did you know potatoes have vitamin C? Vitamin E in the natural forms is a beneficial antioxidant, but in the synthetic form, it is of dubious benefit and possible harm. Polyphenols, this large class of protective chemicals and plants, when we talk about a plant diet, I like to talk about a whole plant diet. And I don't say plant-based, I say a whole plant diet. Because if you're eating a whole plant diet, you're getting loads of polyphenols. And these are very protective. As I mentioned, they're antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, very protective of the brain. Now, inside our bodies, we make superoxide dismutase, often abbreviated SOD. This superoxide dismutase is necessary to protect our brain cells. If we don't have it, our brain cells die. So we need it, but it won't work without three different trace minerals, zinc, copper, and manganese. And the manganese is the most important because the manganese form protects the mitochondria inside our brain cells and all other cells. This manganese form of superoxide dismutase is crucial, but are you getting enough manganese? How do you know? Well, there's three ways to know if you're getting enough manganese. You can guess, you can take manganese supplement every day, or you can analyze your diet, using my diet doctor for instance, and find out exactly how much you're getting from food, so you're neither guessing nor supplementing. And I, uh, I do both analyze my diet and I also take the supplement too, just to make sure that I'm getting superoxide dismutase charged up. Now, another antioxidant enzyme that we have in our brains and elsewhere is glutathione peroxidase. You've probably heard of this. Glutathione peroxidase is this magical ability. It can take hydrogen peroxide and turn it into water, but it can't do it without selenium. You must have selenium. Is everyone sure they're getting selenium every day? Some days I do. Most days I do get it from my diet, but not every day. So I supplement, or you can guess. But it, these are crucial antioxidants that are really necessary. Now, our bodies make only one fat-soluble antioxidant to protect all the delicate membranes in our, in our brain cells, the out, outside membrane of the brain cell and the mitochondrial membranes inside the brain cell. And that, of course, is coenzyme Q10. So there are the antioxidants wrapped up for you. There are, of course, more than I've mentioned. But these are the most important ones for brain health. <laughs> okay, now I've got a chart of some diets here. Uh, what I'm looking at is vitamin C and vitamin E in the diets. Now, only 7% of Americans get the bare minimum of vitamin E. No wonder incidence of Alzheimer's disease is raising so fast. 7%. That means in this auditorium, perhaps only a handful of people would be getting enough vitamin E and everyone else would be deficient. And that's the bare minimum of 15 milligrams or 22 and a half IUs per day. We really could use a bit more than that. So in the standard American diet, you don't even get enough vitamin C 
And uh, vitamin E is seven, not even half of the minimum daily requirement. On the Atkins diet, well, it came up worse for vitamin C, and vitamin E was only five milligrams. That's a tiny amount. By the way, on the Atkins diet, when I analyzed it, the fiber was under one gram. Kind of makes you wonder how those people poop. <laughs> really scary diet. Uh, the zone diet did pretty good for vitamin C because they're eating a lot of berries and a lot of greens. But the vitamin E wasn't high enough. Where do you get vitamin E? Nuts and seeds is where I get mine. Avocados and olives. That's a, those are the best sources of vitamin E. In the paleo diet, which is extremely popular, they did get enough vitamin C from berries and uh, fruits and vegetables, but the vitamin E, again, was too low. The bulletproof diet uh, <laughs> did get barely enough vitamin C, but again, low in vitamin E. South Beach diet, same thing. Now, I have a transition vegetarian diet here. A vegetarian diet can be a healthy thing, or it can be an unhealthy thing. A vegetarian diet that consists of white flour, cheese, and eggs is not a very healthy diet. In fact, the saturated fats often at levels very similar to an American diet where people are eating meat. And they didn't get enough vitamin E or vitamin C because they weren't eating enough fruits and vegetables on this particular diet. The Mediterranean diet got enough vitamin C but not enough vitamin E. What they did get came from olive oil. The vegan whole food diet did a really good job of vitamin C and also vitamin E. Nice on both counts. Now, there's some very low-fat diets out there. The McDougal diet, the Pritikin diet, the Ornish diet. There's quite a few people advocating a very low-fat diet. Unfortunately, vitamin E occurs in fatty foods. So it is impossible to get enough vitamin E on a 10% or lower fat diet. If you get down to 10% of calories, you cannot get enough vitamin E. It's just not possible, unless you got all your calories from vitamin E pills. Uh, the winner was the raw vegan diet, which got 423 milligrams of vitamin C. That's about the highest I've ever seen in any diet. And 45 milligrams of vitamin E, three times the daily minimum. An excellent idea. So when you analyze diets, you get a good idea. And again, the Diet Doctor software I have developed over many decades, it now covers um, over 200,000 foods that you can select from. So you can find even the worst junk food or the, the best superfood in there. Our study came out in 2019 that looked at vitamin C not in the food, which is a little unreliable. People often overstate how many vitamins they get from their food and the healthy food and they understate the unhealthy food. You know, the old story about the health food camp that said, you can come to our camp and lose five pounds a week eating the exact diet you eat at home. How did they do it? Well, when the people wrote their diet at home, they left out the Snickers bars and the cake and all the things that were giving them calories. They made them eat what they said they were eating at home. Because the dietary frequency questionnaires are not too reliable. I like studies like this that looked at plasma vitamin C levels. Now we know exactly how much vitamin C these people are really getting. Whether it came from supplements or food or both, vitamin C and plasma improve the performance on tasks, whether it's attention or focus, decision speed, um, how fast they could recall things, recognition. The dimension group was three times more likely to have low plasma vitamin C levels. So vitamin C is a crucial nutrient. The best way to get it, fruits and vegetables. Can you get enough with fruits and vegetables? Well, as has been pointed out, our fruits and vegetables have been hybridized over time. And over time, they become sweeter and less sour. Well, vitamin C is a very sour thing. It's a pH is three, like lemon juice. So the fruits and vegetables of today don't give us the vitamin C we may have once been able to eat in the wild. In fact, when they look at gorillas in the wild who have similar requirements to us in vitamin C, they're also one of the very few animals that don't make their own vitamin C in their liver. They get 1,200 milligrams per day from their food, whereas the best we can do is eat, get 400 milligrams per day from the hybridized food that we're eating. 
So I consider 1,200 milligrams kind of a basic lower level for vitamin C each day. When you look at the animals that do make vitamin C in their liver, it's a four-step enzymatic process made from glucose, but we're lacking one of those enzymes. There's only a few animals on the planet that can't make their own vitamin C. And these are animals that, or people, that evolutionarily had access to great amounts of vitamin C. If you look at different animals, adjust them to a basis of 150 pounds, the least amount of vitamin C any animal makes would be 2,000, 2000 milligrams per day, and the most vitamin C that animals make would be 20,000 milligrams per day. So on that basis, it might not be a bad idea if we got at least 1,200 milligrams per day. This study, it looked at the risk of Alzheimer's disease they looked at supplements in this case, vitamin C and E supplements, and they reduced the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 40%. That's a nice reduction in risk. The, how did they do it? They reduced the neuronal damage and brain cell death caused by oxidative stress, by the damage from free radicals. However, I must caution you, and I'll explain later, that the, what's called vitamin E in vitamin pills is not really vitamin E. So you must be very cautious in choosing your vitamin E. Having written a college textbook on vitamins and minerals from McGraw-Hill, I can say with certainty that the vitamin E that you're getting in almost every supplement is greatly inferior and not at all truly vitamin E. Now another antioxidant, coenzyme Q10, reduces brain damage from oxidation, perfect. We don't want our brains to shrink down to half, like an Alzheimer's person. We want to keep them full, fluffy. The coenzyme Q10 was found to improve brain function in elderly people. It does this by improving the production of energy in the little energy factories in the brain called mitochondria. And it also reduces oxidative stress. But remember, coenzyme Q10 is essential for producing aerobic energy. You cannot make it without coenzyme Q10, whether you make it yourself or you get it externally. Now, by the way, statin drugs reduce, on average, your production of coenzyme Q10 by 40%. So if you are taking statin drugs, how many people in this room are proud to say they are not taking statin drugs? Could I have a show of hands? Fantastic. That's about half the audience, and that's, uh, that's, that's good. Uh, it is, after all, the best-selling drug in the world. The, uh, yeah, statin drugs technically are hydroxyglutaryl coenzyme A reductase inhibitors that inhibit farnesyl and mevalonate, which are involved in the production of both cholesterol and coenzyme Q10. So it blocks both of them. Pardon my big words. I love big words. Now, we did supply coenzyme Q10. As I go on with the talk, you'll see a yellow line on the slide that tells you what we actually used in the trial, so you can keep track of it. And my book there, Nutrients for Memory, which we have a few outside, and they're available on my website. Uh, I do, by the way, have a downloadable version for under $10. It's the full book, if you want to read it on a tablet or computer or even a cell phone, if you have very good eyesight. Supplementary coenzyme Q10 reduce the production of amyloid plaques in the brain. That's just what we want. And it stimulates mitochondrial superoxide dismutase, which I mentioned about protects the brain from cell death. When the mitochondria, the membrane gets damaged, it becomes permeable and apoptosis or programmed cell death occurs. And this is very common in Alzheimer's brains. Let's not have it common in ours. In the many studies done on coenzyme Q10, there have not been problems with safety or tolerability by people. Very rare to have anyone react unfavorable to this very natural thing that in our bodies. We did support the built-in antioxidants in our trial, and we did this with four minerals. We supplied zinc, copper, and manganese for superoxide dismutase and selenium to support glutathione peroxidase. This way, our brain cells are protected. Now, when they looked at Alzheimer's brains on autopsy, they found that they had significant lower levels of selenium 
in the plasma, the erythrocytes, and nails, everywhere. Why was the selenium lower? Because they used it all up and needed more and didn't get it in their diet. Now, selenium is not that easy to get in your diet. By the way, tahini or sesame seeds are a nice way to get your selenium. And while Brazil nuts are high in selenium, they may also be high in radioactive cesium and barium, so they may not be the best way to get your selenium. Zinc, by the way, was also found to be low in Alzheimer's brains. So we need to make sure we get that. Of course, these minerals are used all over the body for many functions other than the antioxidant functions. I've talked a lot about the mitochondria, the energy factories, and we need to keep them healthy. Because as you saw from the image that I showed you of the PET scan, where the glucose activity was just about nothing in the Alzheimer's brain, we need to keep that glucose activity up. So we did supply manganese, zinc, copper, and selenium in the trial. And you can get the exact amounts and forms of these minerals. The form is very important in the minerals. Some forms are more absorbable and some forms are less absorbable. You have to get the right form and dose. I took these pictures when my wife and I were sent to China. And they heard about my work with Alzheimer's disease and, and they also heard about my work with my herbal databases around the world. And they flew us to Boao, Hainan, which is near Haikuo, which is really coincidental because we live in Haiku and they flew us to Haikuo. <laughs> um, and they're building the largest medical center in the world there. And I took pictures of these hospitals. These are my photos. They're also going to have 52 hospitals when they finish this vast medical center. One of them is going to be an anti-aging hospital. So when we went there, we met with the governor of Hainan, and we were quizzed by the head of the Chinese FDA and the president of the Chinese Medical Association. They wanted to know, are we going to use food, nutrients, and herbs to not only prevent disease, but also to reverse disease and treat people? And we said yes, and they were very pleased. And they credentialed us to work in the hospital, gave us five-year visas and all that stuff. So we look forward to working there. Can you imagine what the American FDA would have said to that question? <laughs> Where's the profit in that? OK. Uh, one of our interventions was blueberries. They improved memory in older adults. In this randomized placebo-controlled trial, I read many studies. Some are reviews of other studies. Some are the actual study themselves. The studies I like the best are ones like this, where they actually took people and fed some blueberries and didn't feed other people blueberries, and they saw what happened. My hobby is collecting studies. So I read several studies every day, and the really good ones I rename in a special way and save, and I just passed 9,000 studies that I've saved as being really great. This is one of them. Journal of Nutrition. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, I am a nerd. Uh, <laughs> in 2018, this came out in the Journal of Nutrition, and they talked about the anthocyanins. Anthocyanins move across the blood-brain barrier. They've been found in the hippocampus memory area of the brain. They prevent oxidation and inflammation in those areas of the brain. The more, the merrier. So you can protect your brain with these. Of course, they have, as I've mentioned, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory functions. They were found in many other memory areas of the brain. So eating blueberries is not a bad intervention. I do recommend only organic blueberries because they're in the top dirty dozen of foods that have been sprayed right on the surface with pesticides. And the pesticides upon washing with soap and water were not removed, according to the physician's working group who comes out with this data every year. In the nurse's health study, they found that the nurses who ate one cup of berries daily reduced their dementia by an average of two years and a maximum of two and a half years. Just delayed their brain from disintegrating. So as I said, I put all of these different interventions together, and so can you. And you have the ability to choose. You can eat the blueberries or strawberries or red grapes. Red grapes are much cheaper and easier to eat, by the way, and they do have the anthocyanins. Or you can choose not to. This is up to you. Medical doctors tell you what to do. I'm just an educator. 
It's up to you to decide if you want to include berries in your diet. And of course, I hope you do, but um, <laughs> can I say? Uh, here's another pretty picture of my wife and our Jenniker. We're going to blissfully visit our sailboat in Mexico uh, in a couple weeks. Sounds good, doesn't it, in cold New York? I'm going to talk about saturated fat. Researchers followed those with clogged carotid arteries, the neck arteries. Patients with a clogged artery supply were 4 to 15 times more likely to have cognitive deterioration. We don't want cognitive deterioration. So we don't want clogged carotid arteries. Now, it's interesting because in one of these two studies, what the researchers did is they were putting stents in because of the clogged carotid arteries. So they tested the people before and after they put the stents in. The increased blood supply to the brain increased and improved memory 7%. And that's only this much of a blood supply. I mean, our, our blood vessels could literally circle the earth. They're that long. They only fixed this much, and they got a 7% boost in memory. Imagine. If you do it the natural way and melt away all the plaque, which may take up to two years, then you're going to have some real boosts in memory. And that's what I would like to see. Here's a couple more studies. In this one, those with carotid clogging, they looked at severe Alzheimer's disease. And they were two to five times more likely to have severe Alzheimer's disease. Now, how is that steak looking now? Little not so tasty? Cheese is probably one of the biggest culprits in raising saturated fat levels in the American diet because it's used in fast food and all over the place and because it has an addictive chemical in it and people really don't want to stop eating it. That's beta casomorphin 7, in case you want to know what that chemical is. Another study showed that insufficient blood to the brain declined memory and learning. And also, this insufficiency of blood created more amyloid plaques, something we don't want. Now, you can see how blood vessels in the brain are really necessary. More atherosclerosis equals more memory problems. And as tiny strokes over and over eat up a memory here, the ability to navigate here. You know, Alzheimer's patients often have trouble finding their way home. And yes, electronic gizmos can help them and help you find people when they're wandering off. But better yet, let's reduce cardiovascular clogging so that People get better instead of worse, brighter instead of fuzzier. This was an interesting Finnish study. They looked at people in midlife, they measured their cholesterol, then they followed them till they were older, and they found they had two to three more times the risk of Alzheimer's disease if they had high blood cholesterol at midlife. So there's little doubt that lowering blood cholesterol is helpful. How do we do that? Well, we eat less saturated fat. And in our study, we attempted to reduce saturated fat to 7% of calories. Well, this was the most difficult part of the entire study. We had a team of dietitians calling people and visiting people and trying to get them to eat less saturated fat. And it was very, very difficult. And I have to say, compliance was not perfect. However, the American Heart Association has since lowered the figure to 6% of calories as a maximum saturated fat. I'll tell you, from analyzing diets, you really can't get down to 6% and still eat any animal products. There just isn't room, because there's a little saturated fat in many, many different foods. And when you add all that saturated fat up on a whole plant diet, you're likely to get something like 4 to 6% saturated fat, which is perfect. But then when you add some one meal of animal fat, it's too high. And then you're risking your brain. What are the highest saturated fat foods? Let's see, should we ignore the one on top because coconut oil is so popular these days? <laughs> Two tablespoons of coconut oil, 24 grams. I know there's a lot of confusion about when people say medium chain triglycerides, which is not an exact term at all since triglycerides always have three fatty acids and none are medium. Uh, two fatty acids is a diglyceride, one fatty acid is a monoglyceride. But they're talking about the length of the fatty acids. There are three saturated fatty acids that are very well proven to clog our arteries. 
That's lauric acid, myristic acid, and palmitic acid, respectively 12, 14, and 16 carbons long, otherwise identical. These three fatty acids make up 65% of coconut oil. So coconut oil is very clogging to the arteries. Also, any extracted oil is not a great idea, because when you extract an oil from a plant, say even if it's a sunflower seed with lots of vitamin E and fiber, you take out all the fiber and most of the vitamin E when you get sunflower seed oil. The oil is something like white sugar. You start with a beet and you get beet sugar. Well, you've left out a lot of good things. And you start with the sunflower seed and get sunflower oil, you've lost a lot of good things. Why not eat the sunflowers? Now, how do you do that? Well, one way is powdering them. Another way is to eat the nut butters or seed butters. Another way is to make I, my wife has uh, cookbooks uh, called, she has a dementia prevention cookbook, and in it is her creamy walnut dressing, which is totally delicious, but contains a lot of the gamma form of vitamin E, also the essential fatty acid, alpha linolenic acid found in the walnuts, but made into a dressing so delicious that put on top of anything, you'll eat it. So that's a good way to get your uh, low saturated fat foods and make sure you want to eat them. Cheddar cheese is high in saturated fat. Two slices, those little tiny thin slices, 11 grams. How many grams do you get per day? 11 grams, that's it, on a 2,000 calorie diet. Maybe 13 grams if you eat a little bit more food. Uh, fast food cheeseburger, nine grams of saturated fat. Milk, yogurt, ice cream, all dairy products have saturated fat. And people, I mean, maybe ice cream, one cup has five grams. How many people eat one cup of ice cream? <laughs> so you, it adds up. What about low saturated fat foods? Vegetable curry, two grams, not a problem. Tofu, a whole cup, one gram. Soy milk, pinto beans, Swiss chard, very low in saturated fat, practically nothing. So in other words, you can eat these all you want. This is a graph from my uh, Diet Doctor software Actually, it's 292,060 food choices in the, the 2020 version. This is the paleo diet that I analyzed, and the top left is calcium. And the calcium should be here, but it's way down there. Very little calcium in that diet. In fact, studies have noted that when you get to a diet that's so reliant on fat and animal protein, there's very little calcium, either in animal fat or plant fat, or animal protein. So it's inevitable that you're getting much too little calcium to support bone health. And the studies are showing that people on paleo diets are getting osteoporosis at an earlier age and that it is progressing quicker. And on the bulletproof diet, even more so. Analyzing the diet's the real key to knowing what's in them. These are the foods that you can eat all you want of without risking your arterial health, your brain health, heart attacks, or strokes. Of course, heart attacks and strokes, each of which I've written a book on, also depend upon you building a plaque in your arteries first before you can have the heart attack or the stroke. So why not tone down our arterial plaque with a low saturated fat that looks delicious? I'm gonna talk just for a couple of slides about Oxidized cholesterol, known as oxysterols, those sharp little crystals up there are what happen when you have too much cholesterol in your blood and it crystallizes and is oxidized. Now, we know that cholesterol itself only contributes to the cholesterol, and dietary cholesterol only contributes to blood cholesterol a little bit. Perhaps 10% to 15% of blood cholesterol levels are due to dietary cholesterol. However, when you cook an egg, which is very high in cholesterol, then you get oxidized cholesterol. This oxidized cholesterol, it goes into your digestion, is built into chylomicrons, which are fat transporters for dietary fat, much like LDL or fat transporters for liver fat. These chylomicrons circulate the oxidized cholesterol throughout your body, 45 times more oxysterols in arterial plaque than in a healthy artery. And the problem is that they can cause, with those sharp crystals, the plaque that sits there year after year. People are 40 years old with clogged arteries, 50 years old with clogged arteries. Then they have a shrimp omelet. Shrimp is very high in cholesterol, so is the eggs. Then 
they may coalesce into cholesterol crystals, oxidize cholesterol, and break the plaque free. And that is where you get either, if it's very tiny in the brain, vascular dementia. If it's larger in the brain, you get a stroke, which can be devastating. Or in the heart, you could get a heart attack. So it's probably a good idea not to eat oxidized cholesterol. They're powerful neurotoxins, and they increase brain inflammation and oxidation. They increase beta amyloids in Alzheimer's disease. In Parkinson's disease, we have Lewy body dementia sometimes, and Lewy body dementia is also very sad. Um, we have worked with people with Lewy body dementia as well, and these techniques are also very effective with Lewy body dementia. Uh, one man uh, came in the clinic, and with Parkinson's disease, sometimes people are getting too thin. So she was feeding him bacon and eggs for breakfast to bulk them up. Well, we got her to switch over to uh, actually oatmeal with avocado. Sounds funny, but he loved it. And when they came back a month later, we said, how'd it go? He said, well, we only changed breakfast. Did you notice any difference? Well, his Lewy body dementia is about 25% better. One meal, one month. What if he did all three? You can do that. I hope he's doing that now, too. So where we get oxidized cholesterol is if we're eating too much saturated fat and our blood cholesterol is raised, that cholesterol will oxidize. It then can enter. Now, cholesterol can't enter the brain, but oxidized cholesterol can. When it enters, it creates a wave of inflammation and damage to the brain. This is really not a good idea. So cooked animal foods have the oxidized cholesterol already. In our bodies, the oxidative breakdown of cholesterol creates these oxysterols that are so damaging. So basically, we don't want to eat cooked cholesterol. Actually, cholesterol is not required for human beings at all. Do you know how many molecules of cholesterol we make in our bodies? 70 quadrillion per second. That's a lot. If you want to know how much we get in 24 hours, you're going to need a calculator with a really big screen. <laughs> ah, this is an image of Maui, where we flew over the last two days we spent flying over from Maui, where it's warm and balmy. I'm going to talk about vitamin E now and its necessity for our brains. It's deficient, as I mentioned, 93% of Americans they analyzed 116 journals in 2019. They confirmed that Alzheimer's patients were significantly lower in vi vitamin E levels in cerebrospinal fluid and in the brain, where it's really needed. Different ways that vitamin E can help. Vitamin E regenerates superoxide dismutase. So you need not just those three minerals, which I hope you can remember, copper, zinc, and manganese, but you also need vitamin E in order to have your Superoxide dismutase continually regenerated. It reduces brain inflammation. It's a, this study looked at vitamins A, C, and E, and vitamin E was the most powerful and gave the most protection against Alzheimer's disease. Big study in China looked at nut consumption. 40% less memory loss over two years in people who ate nuts, and the Chinese mostly eat peanuts rather than other nuts. That's their preference. So nut consumption was associated with sustained memory. An ounce of nuts daily reduced neurodegenerative disease 35% across 29 studies. So that's a different study that found that it's very effective to make sure you have enough vitamin E. The best way, sunflower seeds and walnuts. That, I think it's the best way. Vitamin E in food, they looked at 800 elders, followed them for, eight, for four years, and vitamin E lowered the odds of Alzheimer's disease 67%. Excellent. Wouldn't you like to lower your odds of Alzheimer's 67%? So in our study, as I mentioned, one ounce of walnuts, one ounce of sunflower seeds, both ground up daily. Now vitamin E supplements. Another study here looked at elders with moderate Alzheimer's disease and tried to keep them out of the hospital, managed care, or the morgue. And they gave them a ridiculous amount of vitamin E, 2,000 IUs. Now, the upper limit, the most you're supposed to take, is 1,000 IUs. Now, that's actually based upon real vitamin E. And what they gave them was synthetic. 
and the synthetic vitamin E has vitamin E activity under 1,000, so no one was actually hurt by the study. But they were kept out of the morgue, managed care, or the hospital. I don't recommend that level of vitamin E. Now, on this graph, I'll show you that vitamin E, as found in normal supplements, has diff eight different isomers here. One of them's the real deal. This is alpha tocopherol. This is fake, 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 fake. All seven of the other isomers are not vitamin E. And yet on the label it says vitamin E, so many milligrams. So beware when you buy a supplement. The reason why these are so common in supplements is that the synthetic vitamin E is vastly cheaper than real vitamin E. When I designed the brain and body food for the people who couldn't get into the study, the vitamin E cost as much as everything else in it because I wanted real vitamin E. And the manufacturer kept saying, you sure you don't want this synthetic junk here? It's really cheap. I said, yes, I'm sure. We supplied 500 milligrams of non-synthetic vitamin E with mixed tocopherols in our study to, in this 2019 study in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences, they showed that vitamin E is effective in improving cognitive performance in Alzheimer's disease. But it has to be the real deal. Uh, this, by the way, the brain and body food is, when people couldn't get into the study and they heard about the study at the clinic, we made this up. So it has most, but not all, of the things in the study. You could actually mimic the study by taking this and a few other things, changing your diet. And you could do your own study on yourself. This is Cora. Cora has gotten a written permission to talk about her and her gin daughter, Ginger. Um, this is in Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience. We work with Cora for two years, once a month. And she came in in a wheelchair. And when I asked her what she had for lunch at 2 PM, no recollection, none at all. She couldn't remember anything. She couldn't find her way anywhere. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Month by month, we changed her diet, we supplemented her, we gave her the brain and body food, and month by month, she got better. After six months, she said, my knees are so painful and inflamed, that's why I'm in a wheelchair, what can I do? Well, we looked at her diet, and she was eating fast food all the time, especially chicken. Chicken's really high in this inflammatory arachidonic acid. So she had already stopped eating meat, now she stopped eating chicken, the next month, she came back on a walker instead of a wheelchair. Hey, she's getting some movement. And she's starting to brighten up. You could see the lights coming on. Over time, she graduated to a cane. Her migraines went away. Her mood improved greatly, and, uh, which is nice, because apparently she was, like many people with Alzheimer's disease, a bit abusive of her caretakers. And sometimes this can be from the drugs, too. Uh, so you should ask your doctor or neurologist for an adjustment of drugs if you're Alzheimer's patient is being abusive. After two years, she was able to walk up with no cane to the front of a hospital dedication in front of hundreds of doctors and read what she'd written to the doctors saying that she was fully recovered and she can now read medical journals. And when we asked her husband, how is she doing? He says, I can see no room for improvement. How's her daughter, how's her memory? Sharp. So I'm not saying everyone, yes, thank you. And they did the work, okay? We didn't do the work, they did the work. We tell people what to do all the time and they don't do it. <laughs> but they did the work and I'm really proud of them. Not everyone with Alzheimer's disease can make this full, full recovery. But hey, isn't there hope at least for stopping neurodegeneration? One of the things that happens with these amyloid plaques is they get populated by advanced glycation end products. These advanced glycation end products are twisted, plasticized protein fragments that when you fry or broil or barbecue animal foods like meat or chicken or fish, these form. And then some of them are absorbed into the bloodstream. Some studies doubling the bloodstream level. Then they circulate to the brain where unfortunately we have a receptor appropriately named RAGE receptor for advanced glycation end products. This creates an amazing amount of inflammation in the brain. And the advanced glycation end products go up and lodge in the amyloid plaques and create 50 times the free radical damage to the brain cells and destruction of brain cells. 
by not eating those foods, you can really relieve the burden on your brain, whether or not you have Alzheimer's disease. They're also found in arthritic joints. Good thing to avoid. Uh, so what we did is we asked people not to barbecue, broil, or deep fry any meat or animal products of any kind. And also, they're formed in hard cheeses. So we had people not do that. Guess how the compliance was? Not too good. A lot of fast foods are deep fried and crispy brown with lots of advanced glycation end products. So it was tough. It was pretty tough. The foods with advanced glycation products, chicken, bacon, beef, chicken, chicken, beef, chicken, chicken, beef, chicken, turkey. You get the idea. Now, the problem with these animal products is not just advanced glycation end products. They also have or organochlorine pesticides, rancid oils if they're deep fried, harmane, which increases tremors, especially an essential tremor, very common, arachidonic acid for inflammation and pain, endotoxins for blood inflammation and brain inflammation, oxysterols, which I've mentioned, excess saturated fat, and lack of the anti-inflammatories in plant foods. So I just wanted to mention a couple other things about a plant diet. This is the Neuroscience Nutrition Foundation. Uh, my wife, Catherine, can you stand up, please? She's the president. Yes, thank you. We all work for free to do this research. And we're very grateful if you visit neurosciencenutrition.org and give us a little something to help us keep going with our research. And we will continue with or without any funds. We're very happy to do this research. And this is a little pool, a five minute walk from our house Ah, I kind of miss that pool right now. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you about how amyloid plaques form in the brain. It's a bit of a detailed picture there. Here's how it works. Genes create beta secretase and, and gamma secretase. These two secretases go up and snip off the amyloid precursor protein, which is a transmembrane protein in brain cells. When they're snipped off, and they're 40 or 42 amino acids in length, they go into the brain, and they're neurotoxic. They become oligomers, they're very neurotoxic. Then they combine into fibrils, and then they become the amyloid plaque in the brain. Okay, what if those genes didn't make any gamma secretase or any beta secretase? Then there would be no more amyloid plaque formed, and more important, no more toxic, neurotoxic proteins floating around in the brain. So that was our goal here. And what stops it, what quenches these genes. Now, you may have the Alzheimer's genes where you're four times as likely to get Alzheimer's disease because you're making the pres presenilin, presenile, is one of the genes that make you more prone to have Alzheimer's disease. But SAMe quenches it. So it doesn't do anything. You may be 10 times as likely as other people. It's rare. But having two genes, SAMe quenches both of them. So you are no longer more prone to Alzheimer's disease than anyone else. In fact, less than most people if you have enough. Isn't that interesting? So quenching of the SAMI results in decreased amyloid production in this 2018 study in molecular neurobiology, quote, thus preventing Alzheimer's disease, end quote. Uh, perhaps they're being a bit optimistic there. Uh, but it does prevent the formation of amyloid plaques, and that is well proven. People with Alzheimer's disease were found to be very deficient in SAMe. This is something we should make in our bodies all the time, but they were deficient. Vitamin B12 and folate are what create SAMe. Greens and beans for folate, that's where you get it, those pretty pictures there. And vitamin B12, well, you're likely to get that from a supplement. Whether you eat meat or you don't eat meat, it's probably advisable to take vitamin B12. Folate lowers the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So here we're looking at risk, four times the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease if you're low in folate. These findings suggest that folate deficiency may precede the onset of Alzheimer's dis disease. So eat some greens and beans. Those with Alzheimer's disease, now we're looking at people already with Alzheimer's disease, four times as likely to have elevated homocysteine. That's what SAMe is made from if you have B12, which was four times lower, and, and, and folate, which is three times lower. So in our trial, we supplemented vitamin B12 as a methylcobalamin form and folate as the real folate form. 
This study looked at preservation of brain cells, and they found that if you didn't have enough folate in B12, the gray matter was lost. If you did, it was not lost. Very close to zero loss. Where do you get enough folate? This graph shows you, this I have to give credit to McGraw-Hill for letting me use my own graph. Uh, it is, shows that uh, greens, like spinach, were the highest in folate. Greens and beans, also nuts and seeds, have folate too. So if you're eating plant food, you're likely to get enough folate. Oh, I want to go back one. Oops, that's not the back button. That's the back button. On the little graph on the right, you can see on an American diet, the folate is the bar on the right. The amount of folate we need is the bar on the left. No wonder Alzheimer's is so prevalent and growing. People are not eating enough greens and beans. Vitamin B12 is another story. Clinically, most people who are vitamin B12 deficient in their blood are getting plenty of vitamin B12 in their diet, but they're not absorbing it because vitamin B12, first it has to be to go into the stomach and be broken free from its protein carrier. That depends on stomach acid made by the parietal cells. Parietal cells also make intrinsic factor, and the intrinsic factor is necessary to go with the vitamin B12 into the intestine in order for it to be absorbed. With this complex absorption process, it's very difficult for people who eat animal products because their fiber is low and their parietal cells are challenged by putting out a lot of stomach acid all the time. So whether you are vegan or aren't vegan, if you're vegan, of course, you're getting no vitamin B12, I think supplementation is very wise. And you can have your vitamin B12 checked in your blood. I do. You can also have your homocysteine checked in your blood. It's a good idea, and most standard blood profiles will check that. Now, SAMI also had some nice side effects. Whether you get it from folate and B12 and make it yourself, or you take it externally, it did seem to reduce senile plaques that create oxidative stress. So it's a precursor to glutathione. So it's, SAMI is very protective to the brain in other ways than just quenching and methylating the genes that make the plaques. It also reduced tau tangles. Now, in the picture here, you see that the top one it looks like an egg, and the bottom one looks like a fried egg. The fried egg one is the tau tangle. It's a nerve cell that has been damaged by phosphorylated tau until it really can't function. The connections to other nerve cells, the dendrites and axons are lost with these. But this is very helpful. And you know, it's interesting that SAMI does have side effects. One of the side effects is it is shown to be as powerful in reducing knee osteoarthritis pain as Celebrex, a very powerful painkiller, COX-1. So since they lower the risk of Alzheimer's disease, in our trial, we gave people 200 milligrams of SAMe. And it is really quite safe. There is one drug interaction. It should not be mixed with any antipsychotic medication, especially selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. But just don't mix it with any antipsychotic medication because it's been widely used for depression, and we don't want your smile to get any bigger than hers. So from these studies, we can see that if you just get enough vitamin B12 and folate, you can cut your risk of Alzheimer's down by about one quarter. And here we get a peaceful picture to rest your eyes. Did you know that medicine in America ignores clinically proven medical plants? Has anyone here ever been prescribed by an MD doctor a medical plant. Can you raise your hand if anyone has ever had that experience? <laughs> Not a single hand, okay. That is because modern medical doctors really do, I think ignore may not be too strong a word. But the point is, they are clinically proven. And this is really powerful. So key randomized trials, and this is a 2019 study that just came out, and it's an expert consensus from doctors all over the world who do prescribe medical plants, they're clinically proven. And it showed that ginkgo extract improved cognition, behavior, and activities of daily life, and nothing else did, including the drugs used for Alzheimer's disease, and that the benefits were without risks. However, you must not take ginkgo with blood thinners. Now, this study said that there are actually no documented cases 
of problems when you're taking ginkgo biloba and a blood thinner. However, in an abundance of caution, I would advise you, safety first, do not take it with any anticoagulants, warfarin, coumadin, Pradaxa, Xeralto, Eliquis, any anticoagulants, blood thinning medication, just don't combine them. The gold standard for medical studies is randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials. Nine of these trials concluded that ginkgo not only helped in delaying the onset of Alzheimer's, which is good, but in treating Alzheimer's, which is even better. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that ginkgo protects memory neurons. This is slowing and stopping and reversing neurodegeneration, something drugs don't do, but this does do. Uh, again, based on a lot of good studies. Now, Donepazel is the most used drug for Alzheimer's disease, so they put it head to head, ginkgo and Donepazel. They had the ginkgo group, the Donepazel group, and one that used both. Well, in the Donepazel group, the drug, the people slowly got worse. In the ginkgo group, they got better. And of course, they didn't get vomiting and diarrhea, which I think is a really big plus. And the Donepazel has other effects such as agitation, difficulty sleeping, a lot of very difficult uh, behavioral problems come up with this drug, which I won't go into the history of because it's too scary to believe. The other medical plant we used was Gota Cola. It's uh, been used in Ayurvedic Indian traditions for thousands of years. It seems to be a very safe plant. Uh, what's interesting is that Donepazel is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. Okay, so between the nerves, we have acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. And then we have acetylcholine esterase that eats up the acetylcholine so it doesn't keep transmitting. Well, when you inhibit that enzyme, you get maybe two or three or four bumps to the next nerve instead of just one. Well, this can help with cognition, and that's the way that Donepazil, the most commonly used drug, helps with thinking and memory. This seems like a safer way to do it with Gota-Cola. It also reduces inflammation, which drugs don't do, uh, this drug. Gota-Cola is antioxidant, and it reduces lipid peroxidation, that is the uh, damage to fats. It protects against DNA damage. We did give people, now with the ginkgo biloba, we used a standardized extract of ginkgo biloba. And that's very important because plants vary. One of the objections medical doctors have to herbal medicine is that you're not sure what you're getting in the different pills, and they're right. But with the standard extract, the one we used, had 24% of the flavone glycoside and the terpene lactones were guaranteed to be at least 6%. The undesirable ginkolic acid was kept under 1%. So what I'm saying is that a standardized extract, if properly made, is a very safe and standardized way to take something. And we use that both for the ginkgo and for the gota cola. And I recommend that you only take standardized extracts so you know what you're getting and not getting. And each and every dose is exactly the same. So what we've learned from our clinical trial is to eat lots of antioxidant foods which is whole plant foods are antioxidant. Berries, fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds. We may need to supplement with vitamin C, real vitamin E, folate, vitamin B12, and the four minerals, selenium, copper, zinc, and manganese. We need to avoid animal fat to improve brain blood flow. Perfusion of blood to the brain is all important, and it just doesn't work as well with arterial clogging. CoQ10 and SAMe are both made in the body, and it's possible that you may want to supplement those if you're experiencing problems. Remember, SAMe shouldn't be taken with antipsychotic medication. Ginkgo biloba improves blood flow. That's one of the ways it works, is to get the blood into the tiny arterioles and capillaries inside your brain. And it's not just used for old age Alzheimer's. It's the most used drug in Europe for memory. So students take it during exams, for instance. And Gota Cola keeps memory young. So this is the book, uh, my wife's book, Dementia Prevention Cookbook. Uh, if we only have the nutrients for memory out on the table there, 
Uh, if we run out or you want the dementia prevention cookbook or the brain and body food, you can talk to my wife, Catherine. She's standing here against the wall. She'll be out by the book table, and she can help you to order those. Well, we have actually completed the presentation, and we'll be ready for questions in just a minute. Thank you for being so patient. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you've been a great audience. No one fell asleep. I appreciate that. Um, OK, if you have a question, please say it quite loudly. Young lady back here. Didn't quite hear that. Can someone relay that? Vitamin E or D? E? How much vitamin E? OK, excellent question. Oh, good, you're going to pass the mic, good. OK, so how much vitamin E? The upper limit is, um, I think it's 1,000. Yeah, it's 1,000 milligrams, but I wouldn't recommend that much. Uh, with vitamin E, I generally recommend, as do most people, about 400 milligrams per day, uh, possibly 200. If you have any bleeding issues or you're on anticoagulant medication, you may want to start lower and work your way up. But for most people, 200 to 400 milligrams is a standard vitamin E dose. But you're not going to find real vitamin E. So that's a problem. So in that case, you might just want to powder up some walnuts and sunflower seeds and get the real stuff, unless you can find the real deal. Thank you. Organic blueberries uh, is frozen. Is that OK? Organic blueberries that are frozen, is that OK? Or you have to get the? You know, the fresh in the store. Frozen. 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 Well, yes. Um, we prefer, of course, the organic fresh blueberries, but they're not always available, so we eat the organic frozen blueberries. What happens with frozen blueberries is they're very quickly dipped in boiling water and then flash frozen. That's to kill any bacteria. So the inside's still raw. And uh, we generally warm them up a little bit. Um, just to bring out the flavor or soak them a little bit to bring out the flavor and get them up to at least room temperature. So I do think that the frozen blueberries are good. Studies on them are showing that they still possess the anthocyanins and many of the other phytonutrients that are so valuable. Thank you. Okay, he does have a microphone to help with the questions. Please wait for microphones. There's a live web stream. Hold on. Let's, uh, let's do it by the mic. Just speak loudly into the mic. If I am freezing the blueberries myself, I buy them in bulk and then put them in my freezer. Is that preserving it and because they're not being dipped in the boiling water? The reason they put them in boiling water is to kill any possible bacteria before they freeze them. So it depends if there's possible contamination, then you might want to do that. But it's kind of an industrial process. And uh, I don't know if you can buy the blueberries. If you're eating a cup a day, they're going to go pretty quick. There's more than one person. They'll go even quicker. Well, I don't shop that often. So I buy a whole lot and put them in the freezer. <laughs> I'm not exactly a blueberry expert. Yes. I'm more a blueberry I consumer. <laughs> Absolutely. Everything that I buy gets washed before it gets into my refrigerator. Thank you. Could you pass to this gentleman, please? Recently, there's been a lot of talk about vitamins. Uh, a lot of doctors are saying that, uh, you know, the doctors, I mean, the vitamins that we buy are no good. They're of none effect and all. Uh, yes. Is there any truth to that? I, I, so he's saying doctors are saying that the vitamins you buy are not effective. <sighs> doctors and pharmacists agree that vitamins are not effective. People who work in health food stores say vitamins are very effective. They're both wrong. <laughs> no, they're both right. Uh, because the problem is that the vitamins are made for one reason, profit. And because they're made for profit, they put the cheapest most least effective ingredients in the tiniest amounts in those bottles. And I can't mention any brand names here that are very popular with older folks. But you know, $7 a bottle, you know you're not getting much in there. And, and the, the fake vitamin E, again, is actually slightly harmful. Studies have shown maybe a 4% increased mortality rather than decrease from the synthetic stuff because all those fake vitamin E's are getting implanted into brain cells, but they don't work. 
instead of the real vitamin E. So they're crowding out the real stuff. So I agree that it's extremely difficult. I had to make my own brain and body food, which is up there, in order to find something that I would take because I, as a person who studies and has written a textbook on this, I can go down a line of multivitamins in a health food store or a grocery store, and it's only because I'm very polite that I don't throw them all on the floor. <laughs> so those doctors are right, I think, by and large. Yeah, yeah thanks, great question. Oh, hi. Uh, could you give her a mic, please? Do you have an online store Use the mic. that we can purchase? Use the mic. OK, she's asking about an online store. Well, a store might be putting it boldly, but drsteveblake.com. If you go there, you can get, for instance, all of my books in uh, probably better to get them in ebook format because we'll be traveling for another few weeks. Um, but you can also order books and vitamins there. And uh, yeah, so it's not exactly a store because I'm not exactly a merchant. <laughs> OK, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, okay, please uh, wait for the microphone. I did hear that There's question a live about vitamin going on, and also people won't be able to hear you. I, I did hear about vitamin D3. Uh, vitamin D3 is cholecalciferol, and it's preferred over vitamin D2, ergocalciferol. Uh, of course, that's what I use in brain and body food. Um, it's much better absorbed, much more effective. And after all, vitamin D2 is made from irradiated fungus. It just doesn't really seem to work so well for me. Uh, all of the studies are showing that vitamin D3 is better and more effective. The only advantage vitamin D2 has is if you overdose, it's so ineffective it doesn't hurt you as much. But that's not really something to recommend. Okay, we have a question here. There's something on the radio, his name is Dr. Lederman, and he has some kind of a, um, vitamins in a capsule. Did you ever hear of it, and is it, an, is it legitimate? What about Dr. Lieberman? There's a radio station, 710 AM, and there's a Dr. Lederman that said that he has made a vitamin, that a nutrient that's just all vitamins, and that it's really great. Have you ever heard of it? And is it legitimate? Dr. Lederman. Sure, Kat, did you catch that? Okay, so someone named Dr. Lieberman has, says he has the whole balance of nature. I do want to say that when I go in the health food store, I see these bottles of multivitamins, they're boxes now, and they say live enzymes all over them. And so, of course, I turn them over and read the back, and I see that oftentimes like the calcium is 45 milligrams. You need 800 to 1,200 milligrams a day, and they're giving you 45. So I put it right back on the shelf politely, don't throw it on the floor. Uh, if it has 45 milligrams, when we certainly need hundreds, not tens, of milligrams of calcium. So even though, I, of course, everyone who sells vitamins say they're good. So it's, it's very hard to do it. Uh, the, actually, my textbook on vitamins and minerals is under $20 on Amazon. Uh, you could look up Steve Blake and vitamins and minerals. you probably find it. And uh, so you could read about, in each chapter, the vitamin C, I've got 30 pages, and some of it includes the supplementary forms, and which forms are best. And it's a deep study, believe me, I love this stuff. It's really good. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. We're just about done. Hello? Yes, I have a question over here. I'm here. Hello? <laughs> I have a question about coconut oil. There's a lot of studies that say that co consumption of coconut oil actually um, helps with respect to uh, delaying Alzheimer's, and I know you had put it on the list as far as what oh, to Okay, avoid. sure. I, I know what you mean. This is have to be the last question because dinner is coming soon. That's very important. Uh, the uh, a preemie doctor did have a husband with trouble drawing a clock, and she did give him coconut oil, and he could draw a clock. And I'll tell you, I work with a neuropsychologist who I just got a report of nine hours it took him to evaluate a patient thoroughly for dementia. It was more than just drawing a clock. So her husband did not have a diagnosis of dementia and, or Alzheimer's disease. And actually, because coconut oil increases vascular dementia, we want to make sure not to harm people. So I would very much not want people to have coconut oil if they're having trouble with their memory 
because I don't want people to be harmed. And I think that'll have to conclude our talk because I'm getting the signal from over here. Thank you very much. Thank you.